Well, good morning and welcome to our worship service today. Welcome those who are here in person as well as those online. And uh, before beginning the message, just uh, a little bit of a, an appeal, I guess, to those who are still online that, uh, well, that you will join us in person. Uh, fellowship's not quite the same, obviously. Worship is not quite the same. And so I think we have a healthy dose. Last Sunday, we had 44 people in person and 18 online. And as we see the COVID numbers getting better and better, we encourage those who are online to come out, enjoy fellowship, lunch, and most of all, worship in person. We are continuing our series in Revelation, the seven churches. Minister Chris uh, sent us off in an excellent, uh, in an excellent manner last week with a letter written to the church of Ephesus. And uh, boy, what an important message. It's not what you do as much as why you do, right? Is it out of love? Today, I'm covering the second uh, letter, the church in Smyrna, and uh, I could boil down this into one phrase, be faithful unto death, be faithful unto death, right? Don't forget your first love, be faithful unto death. And so the city of Smyrna is one of the most beautiful cities in the ancient world. If you take a look up there on the screen, that's a artist rendering. So it's a computer animated uh, rendering of what the city would have looked like, located off of the Aegean Sea. Sort of a place where you might want to go on vacation. If you look at the next slide as well, this is the modern city. This is in Turkey, Izmir. And it's the third largest city. And one more picture just for you to get a sense of the scale and the beauty, the hills in the background and uh, the port. And it was also a major religious center. So one more, another slide there. That's uh, the columns for the temple that was dedicated to the, uh, Roma. And uh, 10 cities competed to build this temple. And Smyrna is the one that won out. It's sort of like uh, our modern day trying to host the Olympics. And everybody is competing. It's an honor to build this temple. And then two more slides. One more over. That's the arches that cover the marketplace or agora, which is the key center of the city, where much of the cultural and economic exchange occurs. It's huge. And if you look at the final slide there, you see the, un it's under the covering. And because of its location, there was a healthy economic life there. And then finally, it was a major political center. So the, uh, the provincial assembly gathered together in Smyrna, and the, much of the imperial court and the politics was carried out in that city. So the citizens of Smyrna would, had this saying, the first among the Asian cities, the first among the cities of Asia, uh, sort of like a Chicago, right? If you're talking about the Midwest, there's only one major city, that's uh, Chicago. And in many ways, Smyrna filled that uh, void or filled that bill. And then uh, a lot of Jews lived in Smyrna. So uh, just like I'm told that there's a large uh, Vietnamese community in Houston, that there's a large Chinese community in San Francisco, and I know for sure there's a large Korean population in Los Angeles. Korean food even better than Korea. That's what they're saying. And then, uh, as most of you are aware, there's tension between Roman and Jewish relationship. Because the Jews were so hard-hearted or stubborn from the Roman perspective in their religion that they had no room for give or compromise. And so what the Romans did was they allowed the Jews the freedom to practice their religion as long as they recognized the Roman authority politically. Uh, so there was this careful balance between the Romans and the Jews, and a balance that's uh, not easy to keep because the uh, you know, separation of church and state wasn't so clear back then as it is today. And so uh, two events occurred, and so I'm providing the historical background a little bit, but the two events occurred that uh, made that balance uh, off balance. So first, there was a major uprising in 70 AD. So uh, Jewish separatists and zealots attempted to overthrow the Roman uh, occupiers, and ultimately it failed. But if you remember the story, they uh, hold it up in a uh, Masada, the mountain. Uh, they uh, were sieged, and then 
uh, committed mass suicide instead of being caught. And then that's when the Roman soldiers uh, destroyed the temple, literally brick by brick, because there was this rumor that there was gold that was hidden underneath. So that's 70 AD. Revelation is written late. 80s, early 90s, which means that this letter is written after the tension of that insurrection. And then the second event that occurred that uh, disrupted that balance was the Jewish sect known as the followers of the way. This is Christianity. And they were creating major headaches for the Jews because not only were they converting Jews into Christianity, but uh, they were a cult from the perspective of the Jews of which the Romans thought it was just another denomination. So it's sort of like our relationship to Baptist. You know, that's, pretty, that's fine. It's a different denomination. But our relationship to Mormons, that's different. They're a cult. And so in many ways, the Christian faith was viewed as a cult by the Jews, but as a denomination by the Romans. And that was a bad association. And so the Jews that are living in Smyrna are trying to disassociate themselves from the Christians to prove their loyalty to Rome. They're persecuting them because the followers of the way are worshiping a crucified Lord who was supposed to be in place of Caesar. And so there's a lot of political issues involved. So hang on to that for, for now. And then now we want to go to the middle of the letter. So I'm going to start in verse 9. If we can flash up verse 9. And can you lower me a little bit? I sound loud. Yes, I am loud, right? If Dan says I'm loud, I'm really loud because he is hard of hearing. Uh, can you lower? Yeah, thank you. So, uh, so starting in verse 9, I know your tribulation and your poverty, but you are rich. And the slander of those who say that they are Jews and are not, but a synagogue of Satan. Now, we'll stay in this passage or verse for a little bit. Uh, uh, we saw in our introduction that the church is hammered on two sides, but the Jews on one side, but the Romans on the other. And this persecution produced tribulation, and the tribulation uh, comes out in two forms. One, it's poverty, so financially they're struggling. And two, they're being slandered. So we, we start with the poverty part. Uh, it doesn't take much imagination to see how they would have suffered in terms of poverty uh, throughout human history, when you have a major group oppressing a minor group, it looks pretty much the same. So when you think of the Jews under the Third Reich, uh, if, if you remember a little bit of the history, uh, Jewish shops were uh, uh, singled out, right? So you have the Star of David that's painted. They had to wear the Star of David so that uh, Germans would not go and shop there or utilize their services they would find excuses, employers to let go of Jewish workers. They would destroy their homes, burn it down. And so I can imagine some of the things that could have occurred to the believers in Smyrna. And then, the, to, worse, the Jews were putting distance between themselves and Christianity so that the Christians felt themselves to be more isolated. Now, here's what's going on. The more the Jews isolated themselves and separated themselves, the Romans began to see that the Christians were not a denomination, but a different religion, which means that they're no longer under the Roman law of protection for the Jews to worship above ground. So they had to go underground. They were no longer protected. And in fact, to make things worse, the Jews began spreading slander against the Christians who are now underground and they can't respond and so a number of historical texts reveal, and these are all historical statements, that they ate the flesh of the dead, including the flesh of their own children. The most think that's because of communion. And then only lower class were Christians because you had to be so gullible to worship a crucified individual. They enjoyed the protection of Rome, but they would not join the army. They were cowards. And then they bow down before a criminal, a crucified Lord who was, uh, according to the Jews, a replacement for Caesar as Lord. And so much of this pressure came from the Jews against the believers. And uh, those who say that they are Jews and are not, 
But a synagogue of Satan, I, I want to stop there just a little bit because uh, it's possible to misunderstand these words. I mean, you could get a form of anti-Semitism from this passage. And so uh, very briefly, I uh, want to make two points. One, in the New Testament, not all Jews are Jews. In fact, I'm just quoting Paul from Romans chapter 9, verse 6. Not all Jews are Jews. Not all ethnic physical Jews are spiritual Jews. Or to put it another way, not all physical descendants of Abraham are individuals who walk in the faith of Abraham. This was one of John the Baptist's huge point, right? Even if you can trace your physical lineage back to Abraham, that doesn't mean that spiritually you belong to Abraham. He says uh, God can produce descendants of Abraham out of rocks. A true Jew is one who is circumcised by the heart, not outwardly by human hands. This is all from Paul in Romans. And then Jesus makes a similar distinction. He says to the religious leaders, you belong to your father, the devil. Your father is not Abraham. Your father is the devil. Because they were willing to do the will of the devil, that is, oppose Jesus and God's people. And so since they were pawns in Satan's war against God, your father is the devil. Thus, we need to give full weight to Jesus' words here that the Jews are persecuting the believers and therefore they're a synagogue of Satan. They were not of God. But on the other hand, this is point two, that we want to balance up. But on the other hand, you cannot go to the extreme of what the medieval Christian church did who believed that the Jews were especially cursed by God. So that... This rumor was spread by Christians as well that Jews killed small children to use their blood to make matzo balls during Passover. That they were responsible for the black plague. God was cursing Europe because of them. That they were poisoning wells to kill believers. These are all historical. And that even Luther, it was useless to preach the gospel to Jews and Muslims because their hearts were so hardened. It is one of those ironies of history where here the Jews are slandering Christians and the Christians return to favor many centuries later. And yet, this is the third point, and the crucial point is that in the same section where Paul writes that not all Jews are Jews, at the end of chapter 11 he writes, all Israel will be saved. In other words, while we may have some disagreement as to what this means, I take it that God's chosen people have a future hope, that one day God will move on behalf of Israel. Why? Because just as we sung, the covenant made to Abraham is unconditional, and therefore the blessings to Abraham will pass down to his descendants no matter how unfaithful those descendants will be. So that for now, it's the time of the Gentiles, right? That's why you don't have the Jews flooding the churches. But one day, Jews will come to God in huge number. This is the whole olive tree metaphor in Romans chapter 11. So well, how should we understand the synagogue of Satan? Well, I believe what Jesus is saying is that when you follow the will of Satan, right, carry out his strategy, oppose God's people, when you are an instrument in his hands, then you are carrying out the will of Satan, a synagogue of Satan, just like in John chapter 8. That's their function. That's their action. But in terms of who they are, they are a people of God. And one day God's promises will be fulfilled. You need to hold on to both of those uh, sides in order to maintain the tension of the future of the Jews. And that's why, and you guys are fully aware, that there's a large uh, evangelical segment that is very pro-Israel because of these types of statements. Okay. Now, there, what we have is, do not fear, you're about to suffer. And if we go to verse 10, the suffering that will come, oh, uh, sorry, verse, uh, verse 10, part B, uh, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison, and that you may be tested, and for 10 days you will have tribulation. 
That's the imprisonment that uh, Jesus is speaking about. The imprisonment in ancient Rome, it's not like today. So, you know, if you're caught in drunk driving, you can go to prison for stealing. Even for murder, you can go to prison for 40 years. It's not like that in Roman prisons. Roman prisons, there's only two, two reasons. One, you're waiting trial for execution, or you're waiting to be executed. That was it. You didn't hold prisoners for long in the Roman prison system. So that when he says you're being put into prison, it means you will be executed. In fact, I think a better translation may be the devil is about to throw some of you in the death row. You are about to die. Now, the 10 days there, that should not be taken literally. Most scholars take the 10 days as a reference to Daniel, right? So if you look at the next uh, verse, right? this is in terms of Daniel, test your servants for 10 days, let us be given vegetables to eat and water to drink. They think the 10 days is a reference to Daniel, and what Jesus is doing is he's trying to encourage the believers in Smyrna by comparing him to Daniel, because Daniel is one of the great Old Testament saints. It's like Romans chapter 11, heroes of the faith, right, to inspire us. And Jesus is trying to inspire them. Look at Daniel. He was living in exile. He suffered for his faith. He was tested. He was thrown into the lion's den. But what did he do? He remained faithful to the end. In the same way, believers in Smyrna, to be faithful to the end, even though they were unfairly imprisoned, they're suffering poverty, their reputation is in tatters, and they're living in exile in this world. In the same way, like Daniel, be faithful. And that's where we get the command. If we can just leave up the uh, verses up there, Chris, thanks. Uh, be faithful unto death. And that's, if you forget everything from this sermon, just remember, be faithful unto death. Right? Be faithful unto death. Faithfulness is nothing more than living out our faith. Right? Faith is what you believe in, then faithfulness is simply living it out. You, know, you got that phrase, uh, put your money where your mouth is, or walk your faith. See, these are all cliches imitating what James wrote. Don't be, just be hearers, be doers. Faithfulness is doing what you believe in, and you're doing it with a level of excellence that doesn't change just because someone is watching over you or not. Right? Whether someone's watching over you. Well, in one sense, God is always watching over you. But no matter who's there, be faithful. You know, I ran across a story last uh, week about a, a Roman security, a Russian security guard. I don't know if you heard. Uh, he got a job in a, a museum. I think it was the Boris Yeltsin Museum. And the first day on the job, he got the night shift, and he took a ballpoint pen, and he drew on one of the paintings. It was a 1930s painting of three faceless heads that's worth a million dollars, and he felt like the painting was somehow incomplete. So do you see the two dots on both of the faces on the left and the right? He went up and he drew those circles, and he felt like the picture was incomplete without those eyes. And this is amazing to me. And then the, you know, they asked him, why'd you do it? Why'd you do it? He says, early in the day, two teenagers dared him to. And he just, that thought just got planted in his mind. And then while he's walking the night shift guarding, he realized that there was no security camera in the area. And so he decided to just draw eyes into those paintings. The very painting he was supposed to guard, he is the one who defaces it. That story hits home far more than I care to admit. You know, Jesus calls us to be faithful to the church. And to be faithful to the church means that you protect it, you nurture it, you guard its unity, you help it to grow by evangelizing and discipleship. But these days, it feels like Christians are the worst enemy to the church. Death by friendly fire. We're called to guard the church. And yet, I feel like we're the ones that hurt it the most. Be faithful unto death. Now, faithfulness is extremely difficult, especially in a church context, because you know, our problem is not that if you're faithful, you're going to be put in prison and you might die. Because that's not the kind of world that we live in. But my struggle to faithfulness is that when I invest effort, I want to see corresponding fruit. 
you know, that, that's just the way I'm wired. But if when I don't see the corresponding fruit, then I get discouraged and I'm tempted to be less faithful. It's not like construction work. I'm not a very handy guy. I, <laughs> no, no news flash there. I'm not a very handy guy. But uh, one time, uh, I decided that I would finish my unfinished basement all by myself. So, you know, I got on the computer, and I started watching all these YouTube videos. That's already a big problem, you know, learning through YouTube videos. But I watched all these YouTube videos, and then I went out and bought the wood and started putting in the stud. I put in the drywall, the ceiling. I put in a closet. I did all the electrical work, you know, and I, I'm not a professional, and it shows, you know. <laughs> My wife, when she goes down there, she goes like this, you know, she doesn't know what's going to fall apart. But the most rewarding part of the work is that, you know, in the morning when I go down and I start working, and in the evening when I call it quits, I go and I can tell how much was done. And I call my wife down and say, look, it's progressing. It took me three months. Look, it's, and it costed me more than actually hiring people. <laughs> but, uh, you know, that's neither here nor there. But I said, look, honey, this is how much I got done. And so the next morning, I'm motivated to go down because effort invested, there's a return. But it's not like that in spiritual work. You know, I, 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 I Elder Core, Minister Chris, I, I, we put in 15 hours, 20 hours for a sermon. I don't know how much it gets done. How do you measure spiritual progress in a church? Anything that is measurable is probably a bad criteria for where you are as a church. The things that are really worth measuring, you can't. It's like taking a ruler and trying to measure water. It just doesn't fit. And yet Jesus says, be faithful unto death. Be faithful unto death. Be faithful unto death. But here are your rewards. And if you keep up the slide, uh, here are your rewards. The second one. Uh, sorry, Chris. Uh, I will give you the crown of life. Right there you go. And I will give you the crown of life. This is the prize of eternal life. This is not the crown that a king wears. It's the, uh, the wreath that an athletic champion wears. And God says, look, if you are faithful and you happen to die, don't worry. I will give you life. And in fact, if you go to the slide before, look at the title, right? I skipped over the title, right? The angel of the Lord to the church in Smyrna. This is Jesus talking, right? He's the first and the last. And look, who died and came to life. In other words, Jesus was faithful unto death. He came back to life. You are to be faithful unto death. And if you happen to die, guess what? He will bring you back to life. And in fact, it's not just any kind of life, but I skipped over, right, and your poverty, verse 9. But you are rich. It's not just any kind of life that he will resurrect you to. It is a life that is filled with every kind of blessing. I just want to read Mark chapter 10. Mark chapter 10, right? The disciples are asking Jesus, Lord, we gave up quite a bit to follow you. What is it for me? And Jesus said, truly I say to you, there is no one. Who has left houses, brothers or sisters, mother or father, children or land for my sake and for the gospel? Who will not receive a hundredfold now in this time, houses, brothers, sisters, mothers, children, lands, with persecution and in the age to come? You know, Paul put it a different way. Eyes have not seen, ears have not heard. Your heart has not imagined what God has in store for the servant who is faithful to death. And then I just want to stick, just comments on the first part of the title. You don't have to go there. The first and the last. Right? He says, I'm the first and the last. The first and the last signifies God's all-encompassing presence and where God presence is, there is hope. And that was a song that we sang, the very first song. Right? There's nothing sweeter than the presence of God because wherever God is, there is hope. And what first and the last refers to is that God is present in the very beginning of time and he will be there at the very end of human history. And he's not watching how things are going. He's guiding how things are going, just like a hand within a glove. He's guiding it. You know, it was one of those surreal, surreal moments this week when Russia 
uh, elevated their nuclear readiness so that it was less channels in order for them to fire nuclear warheads. And I saw that. My first thought was, you know, in the 1950s and 60s when they had kids in school hide under desks. And whenever I saw that, I kind of laugh, right? I hide under desks in a nuclear war. And yet, for a moment there, I thought, oh, my. Cold War is uh, back again, and uh, we might have a nuclear war. It was quite sobering. And then those images of over a million refugees, you know, families, mothers with kids, because the men aren't allowed to lead, they have to fight the war. And you see them trying to get on the trains, and the refugees, all, their lives will never be the same. And then I'm thinking, a lot of politicians are thinking, oh, when will this end? I mean, what's Putin's ultimate plan? Is he going to stop with Ukraine, or is he going to rebuild the entire USSR? And in the midst of these cosmic events, you feel so small. I felt so small with these events. And then I was reminded of Acts 17. If you can go there, the Acts 17, I was reminded of this passage. And I could almost say maybe the Spirit brought it to mind for me. And he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on the face of the earth, having determined a lot of times. God is the one who's in control of when a nation is born, when they come into power, when they lose power, when they cease to exist. He is the one that is in control of the times in which they exist. And then the boundaries of their dwelling place. No matter how hard Russia fights, at the end of the day, they will have no more land than what God has determined because he's in control. And they should seek God and perhaps find their way towards him and find him. And that, that, that's so encouraging because God is like a, a, a chess player. I know this is a cliche, but he's a chess player moving the nations around. And he's doing it so that the optimal number of people will seek him and perhaps find their way towards him. That's the goal. And then the very last section. Yet he's actually not far from each one of you. Isn't that encouraging? The God who moves nations isn't so preoccupied with the events that come out in CNN that he doesn't know your personal struggles today and tomorrow. He knows when a sparrow falls. He knows the number of hair that fall out of my head every time I take a shower, and it's increasing year by year. But he knows when I lie down at night. And he knows what time I get up. Psalm 139. So that God says, I know your tribulation and your poverty. See, I know your tribulation and poverty. So that no matter where we are as a church, no matter where we are in terms of our individual lives, and no matter where we are in terms of our world, God knows. He knows the suffering. He knows the tribulation. And he knows the challenges that we face as a church. We have a very rich history. And yet, as a number of people have pointed out, there are challenges that we face. It's not that he does not know. He knows where we are. He knows where he wants us, us to be. So be faithful unto death. Don't worry about the results. Don't try to measure the progress. And most of all, don't try to be successful. That's me. Don't try to be successful. Because it'll mess with your motives. It'll mess with your motives. Because one day you'll wake up, and it will no longer be because you love God, but because you are trying to, what, build a name for yourself? Don't be successful. Be faithful. Because at the end of the day, this is not your church. This is not the elders' church, not my church. It's God's church, and he will do what he wants with it. Just be faithful to the very end. Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning, and we thank you for the power of your word that speaks of a God that is far greater than what we can ever imagine.
I pray, Father, that we will know you more each day, individually as we get into your word, corporately as we go to fellowships and Bible study, and as we gather together on Sunday morning, Lord, open our eyes and open our hearts that we might see how truly great you are. And then help us not only to believe,